Let me start with a question. Are there experiences that we have when we are children that lead us to heroic behavior later in our lives? Certainly we have evidence that a violent childhood leads to violent behavior when we are adults. But is it possible that the opposite is true? That there are things that we might do or might happen to us when we are children that would lead us to be those people we admire as adults later in life? This is uh, my hometown, a small village in Northern California called Mendocino. And I went to school here in the 1970s, and this was a renaissance period in education in the United States, when hundreds of experimental schools were started up inside the public schools. So, new ways, new experiments in teaching children that were just created and uh, uh, incubated by these schools. And I went to one of these schools. And at this school, the teachers were so busy with the children who had never been to school that I was left alone to study photography, to learn electronics, uh, to teach myself how to draw. And what I discovered in this process is that I had a passion, and that passion was for writing code. I spent days, weeks, months in the computer lab teaching myself how to program this machine. And in fact, I got so good at it that I got my first professional job as a programmer when I was 16. 16 years old, and I was writing code for medical equipment. And I don't know who trusts a 16-year-old with medical equipment, but they did. For 25 years, I became the best coder I could be. I managed people who wrote code, I invented new algorithms, I created special effects for Hollywood, I did everything in code that I ever wanted to do. And all of that changed one night over dinner. I'd invited my friends, we were at a Christmas celebration, and I had, as I often do, steered the conversation in a direction that I wanted to talk about. And what I wanted to talk about was this observation that I had that we didn't, as adults in our society, expect children to be good at anything anymore. We somehow didn't expect them to be competent. And as a sort of offhand joke, I suggested that I should start a summer camp where parents could send their kids and I could treat the kids as if they knew how to do things and give them tools and give them an opportunity to build things. And by the end of this dinner conversation, I had four children signed up for a summer camp that didn't exist. That was the very best mistake of my life. Neuroscientists will tell us that we only learn from mistakes. It's the only time we make deliberate changes to our brains is when we realize we've made a mistake and when we figure out how to overcome that mistake. That summer, we started a, a vacation camp for children. Uh, we called it Tinkering School. We gave the children real materials and real tools, and they built real things. Never having started a school before, uh, I decided that we would just uh, we would just build things. Everything that I had learned in my life to that point had come in, uh, in the service of making something new, and I thought, that was good enough for me, maybe that would be good enough for the kids. So we started making things. And instead of starting from recipes, we would have wild conversations over dinner, and we would scribble these crazy notes and then that would become our plan for the next project. This is a little car that you, you row to make it go, 
and you steer with your feet. And, and that was the entire blueprint. Nothing else was figured out. I gave this page uh, from dinner. I gave the page to the kids in the morning. I said, let's see if we can do this. And here's what they built. It's a working prototype of maybe the most entertaining exercise equipment ever made. I'm pretty sure it's going to take off. It's an entrepreneurial opportunity. If anybody wants to make these, you can have it. I was still keeping my day job, still working as a manager of programmers and writing code, and, and I was in the most boring meeting ever. My mind could not stay on topic, and it suddenly occurred to me that in the tinkering school supplies, we had all the things we needed to make amazing boats out of plastic pipe and canvas. And all we needed was some wax to put on the canvas to seal it. And I drew this picture of a really ugly kayak, a canoe, and, uh, and I saved it. And that coming summer, I, I pulled that page out of my meeting notes and I gave it to the kids, just as you see. And they looked at it for about half an hour and they said, Yo, you're crazy, you know, we're all going to drown. And, uh, and then they got to work. And they started figuring out things that weren't visible in my notes and things that they needed to uh, solve the problems they encountered were crazy and unexpected, and they worked on it until they had solutions for it. And then, on a beautiful summer day, we took that boat for a spin around the harbor. And what we discovered in this process was that because we didn't know it was going to work or not, the kids were that much more excited about the project. They were working that much harder. This is a drawing from another conversation with children about creating a giant vehicle for crossing the desert. And the idea is that because your feet sink in the sand, it's hard to run, but if we put this giant wheel around you when you ran, you would always have nice hard pavement to run on. Now, we haven't built that yet, but I included here just to show that this is how little we prepare for for summer camp each year. Uh, we have a stack of these potential ideas and we look at them and we say, well, what's the cheapest thing we could build that out of? Because kids don't have much money and we wanted them to be able to go home and make these things too. One year we collected thousands of those horrible plastic grocery bags that I don't think anybody uses anymore. They, they, they seem to have disappeared. but. Uh, in California, five years ago, we could still get them. And it took us four days, and it looked like the worst child labor conditions you've ever seen as these kids willfully and gleefully wove together bags to create all kinds of things, including this bridge that carried the entire weight of the class. We built a, a train powered by wind, we built a 10-meter treehouse that made no damage to the tree. The children decided that they didn't want to put screws or nails into the tree and that it should preserve the life of the tree. And so we took that as a design constraint and we built this uh, treehouse without uh, harming even the bark of the tree. We built a roller coaster with 40 meters of track. One day, while doing, doing some research for my day job, I came across this picture. These two gentlemen are known as the Wills Brothers. They were early pioneers in foot-launched aircraft in California. And I noticed two things immediately about this picture, and maybe you'll notice the first. These gentlemen are experiencing a moment of pure joy, unadulterated, ex ecstatic joy. And the other thing is that every detail of this flimsy aircraft is visible in this picture. It's made entirely out of sticks, plastic, and tape. And I thought, well, that's a blueprint right there. Gave the picture to the kids at Tinkering School. It took us four days, but we finally got it to fly. What we discovered years later, interviewing the children from this 
week at summer camp was that this project had successfully uh, instilled in them a deep understanding of fundamental principles of aeronautic engineering. Lift, airspeed, drag, center of gravity, these were all concepts that they not only understood, but they had, an, they had a deep understanding of. We even built a motorcycle out of gardening equipment that had been thrown out by the side of the road. The children made me stop, we looked through the pile, we found some amazing bits of motor and things like that, we collected them all together, we took it back, we looked at it, and they built this motorcycle. The children call it the world's most dangerous motorcycle. <laughs> but it was also the most fun thing to drive. What we were learning from this was just how little it took to create a really engaging learning experience for the kids. They were working eight to 10 hours a day at a camp that was meant to be a vacation for them. When they were making, this is the first generation of boat at Tinkering School, and it is the ugliest boat you've ever seen. The sail is no bigger than two meters. It hardly sailed. But because they knew we were going to go out in the actual Pacific Ocean in this boat, they took the utmost care in constructing the ugly boat. But if you give them an opportunity to learn from their mistakes, their designs, and to test their ideas, the very next year, they'll come back with amazing boats. These were built in a weekend for a birthday for one of the Tinkering School students. So, Tinkering School was developing a reputation because we shared all of these images on our blog, and educators were following this, and as a result, I had the unique pleasure and opportunity to be invited to the main stage at TED to talk about my school. The amazing thing that happened from this was it gave me an opportunity to talk to other educators, to people who saw education as a disruptive technology. And what we were seeing was that the Tinkering School students were going out in life into college, university, and creating amazing things. So we started to wonder, did we have the basis for a real school? Could our little Pinocchio school grow up and be a real school? Well, my notebook started to fill up with new notes about crazy ideas, and these ideas were about education and how it might work and how it might preserve these qualities of tinkering school. And after a few months of this, an idea began to form, and we called it the arc. The arc, not like the boat, but the curve. And these three phases, exploration, expression, and exposition would create new, unique opportunities for children to engage with a new idea, to express it as part of a project, and then present it to their peers in the world as a, as a demonstration of their understanding. This idea was so powerful that I wouldn't stop talking about it. Everywhere I went, all I did was talk about this one idea and how this school might work. I talked to parents about it, I talked to children about it, I talked to educators about it, I talked to Sir Ken Robinson <laughs> about it. I would not shut up about it, and that's when I realized I needed to see if it could actually work. I needed to make it. So, fortunately, I found some partners who uh, shared their enthusiasm with me, and we rented a converted mayonnaise factory and decided we would make our school here. And we had two big ideas that we, wanted to, that we felt were at the core of the school, core principles. The first was, it should be the most engaging place in a child's life. And if you can't say this about your school, you should ask why not. It should be the most engaging place in a child's life. And the other one is that everything, everything is interesting. Well, that was a pretty good start. But by the time we had this building, we had no money left. And so we built our school out of cardboard and sticks. 
<laughs> and, and that very first year, we spent a lot of time sitting on the floor. But the school itself became a project that the kids, their parents, our friends, people that we could rope in to help us, and we started to build the school that we thought it should be. And we dedicated our, uh, our lives to constantly evolving the idea of the school and the physical space of the school. And when new parents came to learn about the school, I had to draw the whole thing over for them. This is all we had to explain what we were trying to do. We decided we would be the school that says yes. So when parents of one of the children uh, asked if they could leave four baby goats while they went on vacation, we said yes. <laughs> I just have two words for you, goat urine, it's a, it's a problem. <laughs> Strange and wonderful things began to happen at our school. And as we watched what we were doing and looked at the kinds of engagement we were getting from the children, we realized we were on to something. And what struck us most was how little it took, once again, to create these engaging learning experiences. We treated the city as an extension of our school, and our children spend about as much time inside the building as they spend outside the building. And the people that they meet, they treat as experts. We work together to create new uh, facilities, new buildings, new learning spaces inside the school, the children working side by side with the staff of the school. And now, this in our third year, we have an amazing school. It is the most playful, wonderful school that you've ever visited. Every single parent and every single child who walks in the front door says, I wish I went to school here. We have an incredible maker space at the heart of the school. Are all the tools and materials that you could possibly need to at least prototype any idea that might occur to you. The children work together and eat together side by side, five-year-olds with 15-year-olds, mixed age all the way through. And when we grow up to be a real school, it'll be five-year-olds through 18-year-olds. Our commitment to each other is as strong as our commitment to our projects and our commitment to making the place better through our behavior, through the things we make, and through the connections we make at the school. Educators from all over the world come to visit. You can come too. And they take away, we freely give our ideas, our processes, the things we've tried, the mistakes we've made, and all of the things we've figured out for them to take back to their communities and, uh, and make it work in their community. We know that the school that these people are making in Madrid is going to be nothing like the school that we have in San Francisco. But that's not the point. The point is that they're committed to the idea that children should be engaged when they go to school, that they should love being there, and it should be the kind of place like our school where children cry on Friday because it's two days until they can come back into the school. So I say, let's be brave. Let's take this moment and all these amazing ideas that we got today. Anna told us about the connections that exist in a city like Krakow. You know, um, the, uh, the, all those ideas that are rolling around in our heads, you know, making bread together and breaking bread together and building community around this. Education shouldn't be the last thing we consider when we think about innovation and entrepreneurship. Education should be the first thing. We owe it to children to create a world that is more engaging than a desk and a textbook. So I say, the world doesn't need more children with good grades. The world needs makers people who see the toughest problems of the world as puzzles, and they have the creative capacity and the tenacity to solve them. Thank you so much. <laughs>